Hey there. Before we get into the episode, I wanted to just give you a little bit more context because the conversation that follows between Aaron and I really doesn't have an intro into why we're even having the conversation in the first place. You see, as I was planning out the year for the Business of Christian Fiction podcast and what episodes I wanted to do, what guests I wanted to invite, and all that great planning stuff, I felt like the Lord was telling me to dedicate at least one episode a month to this idea of creating from rest, this idea of doing the work that we've been called to do, but doing it from a place of trusting him, resting with him, not striving, not burning ourselves out. And so I had committed to doing that. And right after I committed to doing that, my friend Erin told me that she actually felt like the Lord was asking her to take a Sabbath year, a year where she wasn't going to write anything. She wasn't going to work on any new projects. And I was like, hey, let's do this episode together, this, these episodes throughout the year. I think this would be a great thing for the listeners to hear these two sides of what it means to create from rest. Because what Aaron's being called to do is just as important as what I'm being called to do. So for Aaron, she's being asked to set things down and rest for the whole year. And what I'm being called to do is kind of dig in and grow a little bit while remaining faithful to resting weekly and trusting God with the outcome. And so I think there's a layer of trusting God uh, for both of us, but we wanted to, one, hold each other accountable, and two, um, document our conversations, document this process, and share it with you in case it would encourage you in your own journey of creating from. So today's episode is Erin's story, kind of what led her up, who she is, what she does, And what led her to this point where she felt like God was saying, "Um, you need to take a year off. You need to rest with me the entire year. And so that will be today's episode. And just so you know, it is a little lengthy because I wanted Erin to give Erin the time to really flesh out what it is that she's being asked to do. And then the episode that will drop immediately after this one will be my story. And uh, it too is a little lengthy as I explain what I feel like God is calling me to do this year. Um, In future episodes, they will not be quite as long because they'll be more of just the checking in and seeing where things are going well, where we're struggling, what God has been teaching us. So just wanted to explain that to you, give you a little heads up in that. And I really hope that you enjoy these conversations between Erin and I. We've recorded a few already and I really have enjoyed them with her. And I'm looking forward to seeing how God... um, how, what God teaches us through this year and how he uses that to encourage you in your own journey of creating for next. Enjoy. So how about you start by explaining how you're going to create for rest this year? Okay. Well, I'll start with how this whole thing started. <laughs> yeah. Um, as I was thinking of a word for the year, because every year I pick a word, Um, last year was collaborate. So for me, I'm very logical. Usually if someone asks me to do something, I'm looking at the to-do list, can it fit, blah, blah, blah. And so I I don't have trouble saying no to people. So the whole thing last year was the answer is going to be yes. If someone asks me, the answer is yes, we're going to collaborate. I'm going to do the thing. And it was a huge year. I published three books. I started a podcast. I signed with an agent. I did all the things. <laughs> they all came up all at once. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was like dozens of guest posts and podcast interviews. And um, I think I had 14 in-person events, like author events, which is that's more than one per month. And I have three little kids. It was a lot. And as I was getting to the end of the year and thinking about what I want this word to be, I was just so tired. <laughs> I was really, really tired. And what kept coming up was rest. Mm -hmm. Stop, actually, was the word that kept coming up. Not rest, but stop. And for me, I'm an Enneagram 3. I'm an achiever. So stop is not in my vocabulary. No, I was going to say, that's 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 not naturally to you, huh? (laughs) I mean, even rest is like, okay, what do I do with rest? But stop is foreign language. I mean... And stop's different than no, right? Like you're okay saying no, but 
to actually stop is to stop. a little bit different for you. Right. Because stop is not saying no to someone else, but it's saying no to myself. Mm. Um, because here's the thing. I, <laughs> my boss was working me to the bone, but yes, I'm self-employed. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know how to stop. I don't know how to put the brakes on. So it was just, okay, God, what do I do with stop? I can't mm. stop. And it right. was, yes, yeah. you can, you can stop. All you have mm-hmm. to do is stop. <laughs> and so, um, as it's I was funny, kind of, like, cause he gives you that, like, you need to stop. But then the question is, well, what does that actually look like? Like what, yeah. what does it mean to stop? Like stop everything, stop like what exactly. And so sometimes I think God gives us things and we have to wrestle out what exactly he's asking us to do. It's that whole like working out your salvation kind of thing. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, so where absolutely. did you go from there? So from there, I was kind of reading through my Bible. And of course, thinking about this idea of rest, I thought of the scriptures about Sabbath. And mm-hmm. so of course we know that you do all of your work in six days and on the seventh day you rest. Right. Right. But right before that are some verses about a Sabbath year where for six years you do all of your work. And then on the seventh year, you don't plant or harvest anything from your fields. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, God, I feel like the Sabbath year is a thing. And Mm -hmm. of course, I did some quick math and guess how long I've been doing this author thing. (laughs) Six years. (laughs) Six years. Amazing (laughs) how that all worked out. (laughs) Um, Are you trying to talk to me here? Um, So I was like, okay, this is a Sabbath year. Once again, the question, what does that mean? Obviously, I'm not a Jewish farmer. I don't have fields to plant or harvest. Um, But I do feel like, and we've talked about this before, when you're kind of co-creating with God, this message isn't my message. These words aren't my words. This, um, This fruit that I'm producing, this harvest, is it's a gift from him that I am to steward well. Mm -hmm. And as his steward this year, he is telling me that I'm not supposed to be reaping any benefits from it. Mm -hmm. Um, Similar to the Jewish idea in in the Bible. Um, Not just reaping benefits, but not putting anything intentional, like planting any new things. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Not putting anything um, into new things that you expect to get anything from it's yeah. this idea of needing compensation for our work mm-hmm. um, and separating that out and seeing that I can trust God for the mm-hmm. compensation. And that compensation might not be anything that I can touch or feel or quantify. And that's okay. Right. Um, now you and so, I did yeah. talk about how you are in a position where you're not the breadwinner per se, you know, in your family. Absolutely. And yes. so like, what God's asking you to do might be different from what he might ask somebody else who like a guy who, or like your husband in this case, like who is the breadwinner in your family. Yeah. And to stop for him is not going to be like, stop providing for your family. Like that's not going to happen. Right. But it might look a little bit different. And so um, we did talk about that because you're like, I don't have to receive any money from my books to provide a roof over my head. So that's going to look a little bit different. Um, But where you landed was, I don't need to expect any compensation for the work that I'm doing right now. Not in this year. Right. Right. Not in this year. So the practical things that have come out of that are um, pricing down all the books um, on all the online retailers. So of course they still take their thing. I can't make them absolutely free, which would be wonderful, but (laughs) can't do that. (laughs) Um, And then there's, you know, printing costs and things like that. But all of the the prices that are out there, that's like at cost for me. Um, I shut down my Etsy, my website, mm-hmm. um, even like my Amazon uh, affiliate links, like all yeah. of, you don't even realize so, is it, oh, all go ahead. the things <laughs> until you start going through. And oh my like, gosh, oh. that's right. Like you have to remember where everything is. Yeah. 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 So I, uh, it's interesting to me because you, you've mentioned this that you're going to do this. And I've been, I've been wondering about this. So how did you come to that conclusion that you needed to um, like price everything down? Because when you were talking about that scripture, what came to my mind is that God is telling them just 
uh, live off of what naturally springs up. So there would mm -hmm. still be kind mm -hmm. of like a harvest. There would still be like a profit if we're yeah. going to like really translate this. But for you, you decided to like price it down. So how did you come to that conclusion that that's what was being asked of you? Yeah. So there's two different verses and they do kind of say it a little bit differently, which means okay. it is open to interpretation. So one is in Leviticus, then there's one in Exodus 23. The one in Exodus 23 says that the, um, like any of the poor can come to your fields and eat whatever they want. The wild animals can have the rest. Mm -hmm. And, and that was more for me, I was seeing that as, you know, whoever wants to come and take can come and take, mm. um, the one in Leviticus is more of whatever springs up of on its own, you can eat from for your family. But once again, I am not the breadwinner. Yeah. Um. So I don't need this to feed my family. Mm -hmm. Um. So you and, saw the one in Exodus more applying to your situation than the one in Le Leviticus. I do. I think, I think that's an yeah. important distinction because maybe somebody who's listening to this and wrestling with what does that mean for them if they were to take something like a Sabbath year. And we'll talk in a little bit about like what I'm doing because what I'm doing is complete opposite from what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but like for somebody who is taking a maybe wants to kind of pull back a little bit, stop a little bit, they might not, you know, they might not be able to put their books at for cost, right? They might still right. need to make a profit. And I think there is something um you know, kind of comforting that God cares for both the poor and for us. Like he doesn't yeah. want us to starve for the sake of serving our neighbor who maybe can't afford it. Right. Like he doesn't, right. he's not going to have you go destitute in serving and loving and caring for somebody who's not as fortunate. And so yeah. I, I think there is something comforting in that thought. And especially as creatives, <laughs> You know, the whole starving artist thing is kind of a <laughs> perpetuated like stereotype. And I think that's because we we want to create for the sake of art or create because we're co-creating with God. And there's always this tension, I feel like, between like business and profit and art and is it ministry and all these questions. And I think when we start talking through these concepts of like allowing God to produce and provide for us, it kind of puts it into a right perspective. Like God does yeah. provide for us. He cares about us. And I think evaluating our individual situations like you did, where you're like, this is not, I don't need to provide for my family off of this. I need to be generous with it. And so yeah. um, I think that's a really important distinction. And I'm glad that we were able to kind of go there a little bit in the conversation. Yeah. Well, and another question that I got to um, was a friend of mine, <laughs> she's, she's business-minded and she is like trying to talk me out of the Sabbath year so much. <laughs> and one of the things she said was, well, okay, if you price down your books, you are devaluing the message, mm. right? Because, you know, there's this perceived value and the price you put it at and all this. And so you shouldn't do that because then you're, you're pricing down your message or whatever. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> whatever <laughs> no, I, get, I get what she's saying. Cause there's yeah. like, when you have things on sale all the time, like we always joke about Kohl's where like yeah. Kohl's always has a sale going on, but that's because they jack up their prices, right? Exactly. Like or Hobby Lobby, like something's always on sale. Right. So you're like, come to expect it to always be on sale. And you're like, if it's not on sale, you're like, oh, what? Like you're kind of never upset about it. it, right? <laughs> yeah. And so it's kind of a weird mentality. So I get what she's saying. Cause you're like, you don't want to get your readers into that, like, or your customers. You don't want to get your customers right. into that expectation of like, you know, but I think that's a little bit different than what you're doing. Yeah. Well, and so her idea was keep them all priced high, you know, or not high, but the regular prices and then donate all the profits to charity. And so then you, you know, you're still giving to the poor, you're doing all the things, yeah. but here's the thing. I'm an achiever mm -hmm. and I know why I'm in this mess. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in this mess because I am keeping track. I am checking boxes. I am looking at the numbers. I am staking my self-esteem on these numbers, my value on these numbers. Yeah. And that is not healthy. And it's not stewardship. It's not stewardship. 
Right. And if I did go that route, I know me and it would be all about how much can I quote raise for charity, right? Yeah. And then it's still about the numbers. It's still about hitting a goal. It's still about reporting mm-hmm. at the end of the year to I don't know, the invisible audience that we raised X number of dollars for charity this year, blah, blah, blah. But here's the thing. I am not keeping track. I'm not, I am not looking at the numbers this year. I don't know right now in this moment, how many books have sold or not sold in January so far, um, because I'm not looking. Mm -hmm. And that's, I feel like the only cold turkey way for me to um, really I feel like I'm in rehab to, yeah. <laughs> to be able to rehab this year, kind yeah. of this achiever side of me mm-hmm. so that moving forward out of this year, I can have a healthier balance of creating without the need to perform and strive and hit all these goals. Right. Um, because the metrics in and of themselves, the data in and of them, in and of themselves are not wrong or evil. Like the money that you earn, the profit, none of that is like, a bad thing. It's not. It actually gives you really great insight into how to steward that better. I actually came across the post. Somebody was talking about the idea of building bigger barns so you can be more generous and how that's kind of like a, like a fake, like their accusation was that it was a, um, uh, masking of pride, like that it was really Mm -hmm. a pride thing. And that is, and I responded and said, I actually think that's just a call to be intentional with your stewardship that if you've been given resources that you can invest and grow bigger to donate more, like, yes, you should be generous in the small just as much as you are in the large, but isn't that good stewardship? Like, but once again, it all comes to the heart, right? Like Jesus, when he's talking about the Sermon on the Mount, you know, he's talking about the heart issues, right? Like we have this like standard with the 10 commandments, but it really needs to go a step further. It's not like, here's the line. Don't cross it. It's here's the like starting line, go further. Like like have a a heart of generosity, have a posture of dependence on the Lord, have a posture of stewardship, understanding that the Lord is ultimately the one who's going to bring about the harvest and you are trusting him to provide and not worrying or being anxious. Cause I mean, Jesus talks about that in the sermon on the Mount. Right. Yeah. And so Which it's funny because a lot of people don't think about the Sabbath command in the Ten Commandments. Like we kind of have, at least in our Western evangelical oh, yeah. Christian context. We pretend like it just doesn't, just exist. doesn't exist. Right. right. <laughs> but he addresses it because he says, don't be anxious about what, what you'll eat or drink or what you'll wear. That goes back to that concept of Sabbath where you're not going to be anxious about not working that one day. Right. You're not going to be anxious about okay, if I don't get this work done today, like how am I going to um, provide for my family, right? Yeah. And so it, it goes back to that whole uh, dependence on the Lord for like, I show up, I do what I'm supposed to do and then God does what he does, you know? Exactly. But we have to do what we can do too. We still have to steward what he's been given, what's been given to us. And this is what you feel like you're supposed to steward this year. I feel like God is asking you, to stop stewarding numbers and start stewarding a posture of dependence. And so he's, he's asking you to stop looking at the numbers so that you can start looking to him. I think there's a lot of layers to this and I'm going to be slowly kind of peeling them off throughout the year. Um, And I I find it interesting. It's definitely a hard issue. It definitely Mm -hmm. is, which means it's different for every person. Mm -hmm. And so there is no hard and fast rule of here's what you should do. Here's what you shouldn't do. Here's what Sabbath looks like. I mean, when I take a Sabbath year, it could be completely different what somebody else does for a a Sabbath year. Mm -hmm. And, and that's okay. And that's good. Um, You have to listen to what the Holy spirit is speaking to you and follow whatever he, he puts before you. But I find it interesting at the end of the Exodus 23 passage, it says, it repeats again, something from the earlier, you know, 10 commandments was that you shouldn't have any other gods before him. Mm -hmm. And for me, the fact that that is in that passage is not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. I feel like me striving, me achieving, me accomplishing the goals, checking things off the lists. I am saying I did this 
this was my accomplishment. Mm -hmm. It is a pride thing. Um, if, if I'm really honest, you know, let's, Mm -hmm. let's get really honest. It's a pride thing. Mm -hmm. And I am putting my achievements, my ability, my capabilities ahead of God. I'm saying that, that I can do it. You don't have to, I've got this. Um, and that's not healthy. That's not a healthy place to be. And that's not a healthy place to create from. So Mm -hmm. part of being a good steward of the future messages that he has for me to share is to put this down. I Mm -hmm. can't move forward until this is resolved. Um, not that it will ever be fully resolved, but you know, we, we got to make some progress here. So yeah. it's, <laughs> I don't feel like God has given me a special mission, you know, like yeah. on the, in the secret service or something. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm in timeout. <laughs> but you in feel the like best, you're in timeout. That's funny. In the best loving kind of way, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it you're is, being disciplined. Yes. I'm being disciplined and it's, it's a good thing and it's going to be a long year. And the fact that he has set aside a year to do it in has me a little worried because <laughs> that's a long time, but obviously yeah. I need it. So yeah. I have no idea what this year is going to look like. So what are you the most like nervous about with this year? I'm just like setting these things down. So like, so hold on, let's re- recap. Yeah. You're, you're yeah. putting your books at cost. Yeah. You're not checking any numbers. Not checking um, numbers. You're not. I stopped do- the podcast. The podcast is done. Um, the episodes will continue running through the end of February because they were pre-scheduled. Um, right. But my work with it is done. Um, see, what else? You're not re- releasing any new books this year? No. I had two set to release this year. They're both going to back up to 2025. So January 2025. The next book in the Goldfeather Gardener series will come out um, and then we'll, you know, keep rolling on the same schedule from there. Um, and it, uh, even that. So as things are going, God is changing, changing things. Mm-hmm. I'll have a plan and he'll say, no, that's not the way we're going to do that. Put that down. Um, originally, I was still going to release that book in May because my part with it is done. It's written. It's mm-hmm. edited. It's even formatted. All I'm waiting on is the illustrations from the illustrator. So I was like, I'll okay. just get those from her. You plug them in, you hit publish on Amazon. Right. That's There's not, not much work. Left. There's not much right. Left. right. <laughs> That's not work. It's it's fine. And I'll just, you know, not make any money off of it when it comes out. I'll price it at cost and then it can still release. And God said, no, <laughs> it can't. <laughs> it can't still release. You will wait. So I am waiting. Um and I wonder if that's like, I, I mean, obviously I can't say for sure why God is asking you to do that, but I like, <laughs> I could see just knowing what it takes to launch a book and get yeah. and steward it well, like, cause yeah. that goes back to that same principle, like just releasing a book onto, you know, like putting it for sale and not doing anything to actually tell people about it or to, that's not stewarding selling right. it, right? right. So right to just put it up there isn't good stewardship. And so, I mean, like I said, I can't say for sure. That's why God asked you to do that, but I could see why that would be a good thing to not do right now. Yeah. And, um, I'll get real honest with you. We're going to be real honest. on Okay. (laughs) Let's go there. Let's go Anything back. We'll go, we'll go all the places. Um, so I was going to put all the eBooks for free and I'm still working on getting those formatted because, A lot of them were in Kindle uh, Direct. And so part of their like program is a three-month thing that you sign up for. So I have to wait for that three-month period to be up before they're released and I can offer them other places. So some of those won't be up until like February and things like that. But um, there is, I was going to put them all the eBooks for free. So you can, you know, read the eBooks of all my post- publishing things for free through um book funnel and i was like yeah i'll use book funnel and there's this handy thing on book funnel where when they get your ebook even though it's free you get their email address right Mm -hmm. and for authors that is that's a huge deal it's a huge deal the email list is a huge deal let's just let's just put it out there and be honest um yep and so i thought you know with all my books being free this year, even though I'm doing nothing to try to promote or grow my email list, 
it might really grow this year. And that would be awesome, right? I had still this secret little thing in me. Mm. Well, you know, there's a button you can uncheck. <laughs> and yeah. the button you can uncheck is the one that requires them to put in their email address. And so God was like, you can put it for free, but it's got to be all the way free. Like no compensation. Because not that, even that, an email address, Erin. Do you address, hear me? Because an email address is, is a potential. Yeah, it's compensation yeah. in a different way. It's instead of paying you with their dollars, they're paying you with your their email address. Right. Yeah. And and I'm saying on the outside, yes, God, this sounds like a great idea. And on the inside, I'm going, and I can still get an email address. Like. Yeah. Stop it. Stop. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> Back to the word stop. So I will be unchecking the box that requires the email addresses. Um, and then there is another project that I was working on at the end of the year. So before I knew about this whole Sabbath year thing, and part of that is like, oh, I've got these things scheduled. I've got mm -hmm. people I'm working with. So not yeah, everything. And that goes to that whole thing about like being true to your word and, and yes. not like default. Cause like that is, Scripture is really clear about that. Like you're yes. supposed to let your yes be yes and like absolutely not flake out on people. Absolutely. Yeah. So I had a project that's going to be in February. You're part of it. It's called the 28 day challenge. And so it is daily devotional videos to try to get women in the word every day for a whole month. I'm really excited about it. Um, but it was going to be a big, like it's free to sign up for, but it's a big email boost, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I was hoping for a lot. Um, from this project because it's a lot of work editing all the videos and yep. putting it all together. It's it's a lot of work. And um, so I was like, okay, God, this is already scheduled. Like I yeah. have to just let this go. I, I'm working with 28 other authors on this. I, I'm not going to flake out. Um, and he's like, okay, cool, cool, cool. But you're not going to keep the email list. Mm. Okay. Oh man, I I feel like okay. right now okay. I my heart just kind of went. I don't know my heart, my yes, face, everything like my kind of like I lost a little bit of breath there. I was like, oh my yep. gosh. I know. Are like non authors are like, okay, so yeah, but it's There's this so is how work. you get paid, right? This yes. is how you oh, grow your God. audience. I didn't this know you were not doing that. Okay. Why we do the work? Yeah. But is it supposed to be why we do the work? And that's when God said, yeah, why are you doing this? Okay. Well, the reason at the beginning that I said in my out loud voice was so that women can be in the word every day for 28 days for a whole month. Right. Mm -hmm. If that is why I'm doing this, then would I still do it with no email list? Yeah. And the answer should be yes. It should be yes, yes, yes. And if the answer is not yes, then I should not be doing this. Mm. And I'll tell you, I argued with you for several I'm not, days. I'm not dis disagreeing <laughs> with you, but I'm like, yes, I'm, trying, but. I'm just wrestling with that uh, concept. Yes. It's like, yes. okay, so if we're going, is Are that going just there? this year or is that like going forward? Is that the posture you should be taking? Right. How, I don't where, know. where is that line between this is our job. Like this is yep. a job that we're doing. It's like you said, it's work. It's a lot yes, of work. A lot of work. And there's so financial in you know, investment that goes into it, the tools yep. you're using, people don't even um, really understand the sheer amount of things that you have to yeah, um, the utilize behind the scenes. Yeah. To utilize, yeah. to, to even make the content that just easily gets consumed. I think yeah. about um, this person I follow on Instagram. Uh, she, they, her and her husband make these really funny videos and I love watching them. And I, the other day I was just thinking about how much time and energy and effort they have to, um, put into that and what the financial cost probably is for them. Um, now she does have like sponsorships and brand deals and I'm like, well, good for her because I know yeah. how much work, <laughs> how that, much work 30 that is second video really is, but that's yeah. a lot that's going into it. And so, um, yeah, there's this fine line between we're doing this because it's a ministry and we're doing this because we want to serve our neighbor and love our, you know, love our neighbor. Well, um, we're doing this because we want to share God's message that he's given us, but it is our job and yeah. we are receiving compensation for it in different ways. And I think that's okay for us to do. 
So I guess maybe it just kind of goes back to that heart issue you're talking about. Like, would I yeah. still be willing to do this if I didn't receive compensation? Right. I guess maybe the next question you would ask yourself is, okay, if I'm not willing to do this without compensation, is this the right thing for me to be, to be putting my time towards? Right. Because it kind of is the next step. Like, I'm going to steward this well, my time and my finances and my creative um, resources. So if I'm putting all of that time and energy into something, it better be something that I truly believe in. Well, that even if I don't make any money from it and maybe, and maybe it's, I have so much of the year I can devote to things like that. And maybe part of the year needs to be things that I'm not talking about this particular year for you, but just I'm talking about in general, because I know this is a question that I struggle with as a creative. I know many other people struggle is like balancing that ministry business side of what we do as Christian creatives, um, creating this art with a message to serve somebody, but also needing to be able to fund all the costs that you don't see, you know, and make a profit from it. Cause the money, I mean, the time that we are investing into these things is taking away time from other things. And I guess maybe that's where your question about would I be willing to do this, even if really comes into play, because you are sacrificing something else in order to put time towards this. And so maybe that compensation, maybe that's all you need from that in that moment. Maybe that's what God's telling you. Yes, steward this in order to receive compensation. But maybe there's times where he's saying steward this just because I told you to steward it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so is there anything that you're particularly nervous about with this year? Um, so I heard from my agent yesterday. I was just going to ask you about that. I was like, I want to go there with you. As far as I know, doesn't know about this year. (laughs) I haven't told her if she knows she found out somewhere else. Um, yeah. So yesterday, now the proposal we had been working on throughout since August, Mm -hmm. um, well, really since July. And so it was finally yesterday. She gave me the green light. Okay. The proposal is ready. I'm going to start sending it out to publishers. So that's not my job. That's her job. Mm -hmm. My job was the proposal and it is done. Um, I don't know what will happen if something happens. I'm kind of hoping nothing happens. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> At least until January of 2025. Um, and it's so funny. You're probably like the only author out there right I now. Who's like, I hope my proposal doesn't get picked up. Well, you know, at the rate that the traditional publishing True. publishing just thing moves, I'm, I'm not too worried. But, but I am a little worried. I am a little yeah. worried. And because you know, the next, qu- like, I was going to ask you about this. The next like, qu- yeah. Then what? Because, because, oh, no. well, one, like, what do you do if somebody offers you a book deal and says, all right, this is your now your deadline. And that's sewing into something new that's going right. to make you a profit, right? There's right. probably going to be yeah. advance. There's yeah. potential royalties. Yeah. But more so than that, I was just curious as we were talking, Um, your agent, I'm sure, is probably not super happy to hear you say that you're not going to work on your email list. Right. She Well, like I said, we or your have platform. that conversation. Yeah. Um. So all the numbers on the proposal are like up through December mm-hmm. um, and they're looking good. <laughs> I was going to say, because for people who don't understand a book proposal, a oh, book yeah. proposal, part of what you do when you present a proposal to a traditional publisher is you have to outline what your platform looks like. And platform can be anything from social media to different network groups that you're a part of, different podcast downloads, um, email lists. Uh, what else is on your platform normally? Um, speaking engagements, so things like that. Like there's so many different ways you can go about putting your platform out there. And so, um, but they want to see numbers and they want to see projected growth of numbers. Right. Yeah. And so they want to see where your numbers have been, where they're going, all of that. And yeah. so I was kind of wondering about a few minutes ago, (laughs) if you had had this conversation with her, because I haven't, no. Okay. And do you intend to, (laughs) I I don't know. I'm kind of waiting until we need to, 
I don't know if that's the right path to take or not, but something to pray through. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. For sure. (laughs) That's hard. That's hard. Um, Yeah. yeah. Because like, how can you not? And I guess it just kind of goes to the fact of like, this is what I'm doing this year because I feel like God asked me to do it. And And so if that works with, and you know, they've got a publishing model and if it works with them, it works. If not, like, I guess. Yeah. And I don't work for her. No, you don't. I work for God. Mm -hmm. And my boss tells me that I'm not growing my platform this year. Yeah. Um, Now, is he able to handle that for me? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If it needs to grow, it's going to grow. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but you're not expecting it to. I'm not expecting it to. No, I See, was I think that when I, I started wanted... this. Yeah. But I'm not now. <laughs> and I... I'm not now. <laughs> I'm very proud of you, Erin. Thank you. <laughs> I think that I, I want to kind of like harp on that point because I've heard a lot of people lately, their response to, I'm feeling burnt out about platform growth. I don't want to do the platform growth. It seems ridiculous that publishers want this platform growth. But the (laughs) response to it is to just be like, well, if God wants to, I'm just going to not do anything. And if God wants to grow my platform, he'll grow my platform. And it's not really about their heart behind it like it is for you. It's more of just being apathetic and wanting to give up. And so Mm -hmm. they just kind of pull out the God card and just be like, well, if God wants it to happen, he'll make it happen. And I and I think that's a good posture to take if it's genuine. Is right. it is this a genuine I'm stewarding what I can and God will fill in the rest rather yeah. than just a I'm giving up and if God wants to make it happen, he'll move mountains. Yeah. You know, there's just a different posture to take there. But what I'm hearing from you is not that apathetic, like I'm just giving up. It's more of just a real you know, like a realism. Like if I don't put something into the social media into the platform, podcasting, whatever circuit, I'm probably not going to reap anything from it because I'm not right. sowing anything into it. It's just yeah. basic. That's how it works. Now, you're not limiting God and saying he can't work, but you're also saying if he does, then that's his choice. Right. I'm stewarding the stopping and the posture of dependence on him. I'm not stewarding numbers, but not because I want to give up, but because I need to just stop. Because it's a heart issue. It's a pride issue. Yeah. And so. And here's the thing. None of this is a surprise to God. Um, Mm -hmm. He knew about this Sabbath year way, way, way before I did. And I find it interesting. um, In one of the passages, it says that God is going to give you three times the harvest the year before the Sabbath year so that you're provided for. I did not know last year that this was going to be a Sabbath year. I didn't know until the beginning of December. Mm -hmm. Um, And. He did. Right. He did provide more than three times. My, like you're saying, a lot of people like give up because they're tired of trying to roll this, you know, big stone up the mountain or whatever. <laughs> it but totally feels like that sometimes. It just keeps rolling back down on top of you. <laughs> but crushing you on the way back. <laughs> yes. Every time. Every time. That's not what's happening here because what's actually happening is I am throwing on the brakes with a speeding train. I mean, last year was, it was a really good year. Mm -hmm. My email list grew by 750%. That's, that's, that's more, that's more than enough. That's that's that three years worth of harvest in one year, right? Um, God knew Mm -hmm. when an agent was going to sign with me. That was not my plan for last year. You know that. Yep. Um, you t- we talked before the conference. We talked after that conference. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Signing with an agent was not the plan and a complete surprise. Um, God knew that 10 days into this year, the agent would then be ready to pitch my proposal to publishers. Yeah. This isn't a surprise to him. Um, and honestly, if there's a problem with the publisher for some reason because of this circumstance, then that means it wasn't the deal that was supposed to go through. Mm -hmm. And I need to be able to rest in that and trust that he's going to provide the same way that he's provided before. And his, his call to me to take a Sabbath year this year 
is not going to stand in between his will for me. Mm. It's going to facilitate it. And so if it is standing in between me and something, then that something is not where I'm supposed to be. And that's a lot easier to say right now than it is maybe to say later when I'm actually possibly in that scenario. But for now, I'm going to say it. (laughs) <laughs> so that later I'll believe it. I'll probably write it down. So I yeah, like, it. No, that was really good what you just said. And so, yeah, definitely write it down because you're yeah. going to, it just, well, I mean, God tells, um, he tells the Israelites so often. And I think he tells us a little bit too, to remember yes. who he is and what he's done because it's so easy for us to forget. I mean, yeah. no, look at the Israelites. They literally get, they brought out of Egypt, they go through the Red Sea and they're like, barely past that and they're worshiping a golden calf you know like it just it doesn't take very long for us to get sucked into our own need like our own sense of survival or our own Mm -hmm. sense of like providing for ourselves and I think it's really interesting because in um I was looking at Genesis chapter one and two layered on the ten commandments and then layered on to the sermon on the mount Mm. and what I noticed there was in um the command to like the first two commands are have no other gods before me and then make no car carbon image right and there's specific wording there about um not making carbon Im- carbon images of like birds of things in the sea so things in the sky say things in the sea animals and creeping things which i thought was funny that there's a distinction between just like animals and creeping things, but I guess reptiles. Um, but when you go to chapter one of Genesis, you can actually see God saying, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and give him dominion over the things in the sky, the things under the sea, the animals and the creeping things. And you're like, whoa, whoa what? Like they were, this is getting mentioned again in Exodus with the, the commands, the first two commands. And it struck me how we have been created in God's likeness to essentially be his image bearers, right? Like we're his, I know this sounds really weird, but like his idol, right? Like his, his like reflection, the thing that is his representation here on earth. And we're supposed to have dominion over these things. We're just supposed to like steward creation. And it struck me that we're not supposed to have these things that we're supposed to be stewarding be our gods. Because we're supposed to have stewardship of them so that we reflect God's image as creator, right? So, like, there's this tension, I think, where we always want to put the things that we're stewarding over us. Like, we always want to make these things that we steward into our gods, into our idols. And God's like, no, 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 no. You're supposed to steward those things. You're supposed to have dominion over them because you're made in my likeness. You're made in my image. And I think that was the first time that it really, like, stood out to me that way. I love that. Oh, my gosh. Because you write the books. The books don't write you. Yeah. Yeah. You steward the message he's given you. The message he's given you doesn't steward you. Like you're not a slave to that message. You're not a slave to that product. You're not a slave to that, that thing that you've created. You're supposed to have dominion of it so that you can reflect his goodness and his love and his mercy and his compassion. Mm. So um, I'm excited to see where God takes you this year. I'm excited to see what it's going to look like um, in practicality. (laughs) (laughs) So far, it's been humbling, very humbling. Yeah. Yeah. And so it'll be, I wonder at what point you're going to be like, okay, I'm a little bit bored now. I know. I get bored really easily. I've already had a book idea and had to like set that down. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) The achiever in me wants to do a lot of things, but we'll see. I think I'm going to learn a lot of things. So are Um, you like not writing at all? Are you like doing nothing or are you like just stopping that? Creating things to make a profit or like stewarding the things to make a profit or whatever. Right. Yes. So usually when I start a writing project, I immediately think, because this is how we're trained to think as writers, um, okay, what trim size, what audience, what, you know, paperback, hardback, what's yeah. going to be the price point? How will I market this? I mean, it, it yeah. always goes backwards, you know, yeah. from the Which idea. Which makes sense because you have to have yeah. the big picture in order to write, you know, work the little details. Yeah, but you, still. you're creating a product. So mm-hmm. it immediately from the idea onset, you're thinking, can I market this? Is it marketable? Mm-hmm. Um, 
so I am writing things that are probably not marketable, um, that are not, that I don't have any plan to promote them in any way, to do anything with them. Um, I've been collecting some of my grandfather's memoirs and stories and writing those down, which oh, fun. obviously those are going to be nothing for anyone but us. Mm -hmm. Um, But you and wouldn't have time to do that project otherwise. exactly, exactly. Yeah. He's 96. I mean, we don't, we don't have a lot of time here to get these stories. So, um, I'm just enjoying that time getting to spend it with him and hear his stories and write them. And I've been journaling a lot. So that's the other thing. Usually I journal like on my laptop. Um, mm -hmm. and now I'm doing it by hand because I don't want to see how many pages I've written, how many words I wrote. Wow. You're like really going, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to come back. on. <laughs> so, that. so let's just go there for a second. Yeah. Um, to the person who would say, okay, you're, you're starting to be a little legalistic about this. What would you say? Mm -hmm. I know what I need. I, mm. I know what I need. I need cold turkey. I mean, I really do. And the fact that that feels like an accomplishment is a problem, right? The mm. fact that I'm like, I wrote and I don't know how many words it was. <laughs> Good I <for> should <laughs> have plenty of days where I write and I don't know how many words it is. It shouldn't be <laughs> about meeting a quota, yeah. right? It should be, yeah. I wrote what was on my heart. It is out now. I can move forward. I feel like that's when you're in your best writing flow, right? That's when the yeah. best writing happens. That's when the best stories come out. That's when the the projects that are closest to the heart, you know, they're happening when you aren't having to stop to check the word count. Yeah. And so I do find like, yeah. I'm, I'm like, okay, I, there's gotta be a way to go in and out of that flow, right? Mm -hmm. Because you, you do need to have an idea of like product viability, right? Because you do have to kind of think of the end goal, Unless you just are making something without any intent to publish it, right? right? But if your intent is to sell copies of this book and get it to people, then you have to think market viability and you have to think, how do I um, create this product in a way that is serving the reader well and something that they're going to want to trade their hard-earned earned money for? And, you know, I want to make sure that I'm giving them a quality product. So if I'm going to do that, then I need to know X, Y, and Z. But I have to be able to take X, Y, and Z and then set it aside and then enter into that creative space where this is just like on the back burner, kind of influencing, but not overtaking it. And so it's a really hard thing to do as a creative to think businessy, think creatively, and then come out of that and think businessy again. And I, I, the whole thing I feel is creative, but it's definitely got its bits and pieces to it. And so it is hard to do. Yeah. And maybe that's our transition right there because I'm excited that we're doing this together because your year is going to look very different. Yes. And so that brings us back to that question you just asked of maybe there is a way to come in and out of this creative flow where like, how do we marry these two things? Like for me, I, in a year, I'm going to come out of this. <laughs> I'm going to re-enter the world. I don't at know what that's going to look yeah, like. At some point, this thing is going to end. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. I'm going to have to figure out how to balance. Um, what does it look like to still create from right. a place of rest, but that also is a viable career that mm -hmm. includes making money and gaining, you know, platform numbers and growing an audience and all of that. So that's more of what your year is going to look like. And yeah. I'm curious to know, tell us, tell us about your year. 